In Tampa, Florida, women become a sadistic killer's prey and cemeteries his personal dumping ground. As the body count rises, detectives confront a serial killer using science as their only weapon. In North Carolina, a young mother disappears on her way home from work. When her body is discovered, detectives must expose the hidden tracks of a killer if they are to find justice for her family. In most homicides, police rely on motive to pursue a murderer. But when the killer is a stranger, the crime may go unsolved for years. It takes a full arsenal of forensic techniques to trace a lethal encounter. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. Tampa, Florida, October 10th, 1986. Detective Robert Parrish received a disturbing call. A jogger had discovered the nude body of a young black woman at Centro Espanol Cemetery. Crime scene investigators were dispatched to the scene. As they set up a perimeter, Detective Parrish questioned the jogger. Ron Denny said he ran through the cemetery daily. He rarely saw anyone. But this morning was different. The detective examined the body for injuries. We had a new black female in an open cemetery lot here. We found no signs of any cutting or stabbing anything, no open wounds like that. She did have a fine mist of blood on her right side, it appeared to come out of her nasal area. This indicating that she had uh, died either by blunt trauma or by asphyxiation. Based on the condition of the body, it appeared the victim had been murdered less than 12 hours earlier. More than enough time for the killer to flee. Detective Parrish knew it would be a difficult case. They had to conduct a thorough search of the crime scene. As they photographed the victim, they noted she was barefoot. Oddly, the bottoms of her feet were clean. The ground was moist. She couldn't have walked to this location. And investigators saw no evidence she was dragged. The victim's personal effects were scattered all over the area. Each piece was numbered and cataloged as potential evidence. We found her panties and top and her wig scattered throughout when we did a crime scene search. The forensics team recovered a pair of women's shoes. There were also beer bottles and a cigarette pack but there was no wallet or driver's license to identify the victim. Not far from the body, investigators found fresh tire tracks. Detective Parrish surmised the victim had been killed elsewhere and dumped in the cemetery. item that we found was nine feet from her head 
in the soft dirt there was a tire impression, obviously made by a big tire. Additionally, off 46th Street here, we had tire tracks coming in and what appeared tire tracks leaving. A large vehicle, a truck or an SUV, made the tracks. Technicians made casts of the tread prints using plaster. Based on the condition of the body, investigators were confident a vehicle had been involved in the crime. The plaster would set in minutes, but it would take days to determine whether the tracks were significant. After processing the crime scene, officers canvassed the neighborhood, hoping that someone might have seen or heard something the night before. When was the last time uh, you talked to him? I'm not sure. Nobody not sure had. Okay, uh... At autopsy, the medical examiner noted pitula, a pinpoint hemorrhage in the victim's eyes. This, as well as linear abrasions on the collarbone and throat area, indicated that the victim had died from asphyxiation. Several bones in her neck were also broken. The medical examiner determined that a large individual had used his hands to manually strangle the victim. Ligature marks on her wrists revealed she had been bound before she was killed. Based on the degree of rigor mortis and the amount of insect activity, the medical examiner concluded that she'd been killed less than 12 hours earlier. Strands of the victim's hair were collected. In the event a suspect emerged, it was possible a strand of her hair was still in the suspect's vehicle. Identifying the victim was their next priority. Fingerprints were taken and run through the Tampa Police database. Within hours, Detective Parrish had a match. The victim was 34-year-old Tamara Jones. After I found her identity, I located her mom and broke the news to her mom. and and then got as much information, you get as much background information you can about their habits, who she was seeing, any steady boyfriends. From Tamara's mother, Detective Parrish learned a lot about the victim. She had been an outgoing girl, full of promise, until the lure of crack cocaine reduced her to a life of painful addiction. To pay for her habit, Tamara became a prostitute. There was about four different bars in what we call the West Tampa area that she frequent. And in my job as an investigator, I had to go to the bars, find out who she knew, who she was seen with, and just do some good legwork. You know, I found out that everybody spoke fairly highly of her. All the people I interviewed said that she was a, a very good girl and she was a very good individual. Yeah, talk to but Tamara's life on the streets put her in contact with a lot of unsavory characters. No one that the police talked to was able to pinpoint a suspect in Tamara's murder. Detective Parrish hit a dead end. He now looked for clues in other unsolved homicide cases. Not only from Tampa, but in Hillsborough County and surrounding cities. It took a week to review two years' worth of homicide files, looking for similarities. In the end, Detective Parrish was stunned by what he found. Detectives had been working on several of the reports of previous homicides and similar type victims. We had other black females they were um, known prostitutes. They were found in cemeteries. They were nude. They were all strangled. They had uh, literature marks 
around their wrist, which means they had been uh, either tied up or a, a, a restraining type device used on their wrist. Detectives from the Tampa Police Department and Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office pooled their resources. Along with other agencies in the area, they formed a task force to find and stop a killer. But the lack of physical evidence found at each of the crime scenes and the lifestyle of the victims made them difficult cases to solve. Detective Parrish was certain they were dealing with a serial killer. Somewhere in the Tampa area, he was waiting to strike again. And police hadn't a single clue to his identity. Authorities in Tampa, Florida, were certain they were dealing with a serial killer. Two recent homicides bore striking similarities to a string of murders that went back over two years. Detective Robert Parrish knew they needed a suspect. But none of the investigators working the case had even a clue. All the other detectives were obviously involved in the other cases and were at different stages, but you know, nobody really had anything concrete that we could say 100% sure. Several of the other detectives had different leads that they were investigating. And Garden of Memories. News reports about the latest victim caught the attention of a potential witness. A man named Adam Childs contacted police. He told them that he knew Tamara Jones from the Tampa bar scene. He had seen her the night before her body was found in the cemetery. A dark truck approached Tamara on the street. She talked to the man inside. Childs had seen the vehicle in the neighborhood, but he didn't know to whom it belonged. For investigators, the dark truck rang a bell. They searched their files once again. Eight months earlier, a prostitute claimed that a customer in a dark truck had tried to kill her. The woman was afraid to press charges, but she agreed to speak with police about the incident. What happened inside the truck? As she told investigators, a large black man she knew as Big Mike tried to pick her up that evening. They were talking about, um, you know, something on a prize for sex, and then he had. Uh, I grabbed her around the throat and started to choke her. She reached for the doorknob and then she got out, ran and screaming through the neighborhood. The police were called and he had fled the scene. She gave investigators descriptions of Big Mike and the truck he was driving. But she again refused to press charges or to testify against him. Investigators checked their files. Big Mike was the nickname of a Tampa man named Michael Tyrone Crump. Police went to Crump's residence. The suspect was not at home, but a dark truck matching the witness's description was parked in the driveway. The officer photographed the vehicle. Detective Parrish then asked Adam Childs to come back to the station. I did what's called a photo pack. I took, um, you know, six uh, different pictures of different trucks, including this individual we now become to label as a suspect. And the witness immediately picked out the truck. Tampa police believed that Michael Tyrone Crump had committed at least two crimes, but they didn't have sufficient evidence to arrest him. Based on their two witnesses, they did have probable cause that these crimes were committed in his truck. 
and police have the authority to seize a vehicle if they believe it was used for illegal activities and may contain evidence of those crimes. Detective Parrish wanted to seize Crump's vehicle in a public place when it was on a public roadway. We stopped the truck on the city street and informed uh, the driver, who turned out to be Michael Tyrone Crump, that we needed his uh, truck for evidence. It was used in a recent crime. You contact me at. When we finish processing your truck, I'll give you a call. Crump remained calm, even when they asked if he knew Tamara Jones. He said no. They informed him that he was not under arrest and that he was free to go. His truck was taken to the Pinellas County Sheriff's impound lot, where it was examined by trace evidence specialist Timothy Whitfield. As a part of searching the vehicle, uh, we were charged with finding any and all evidence that might be in there, from the things that are visible to the things that might be invisible to the naked eye. Investigators first processed the vehicle for visible evidence. They found a woman's earring on the floor of the cab. They also found a wooden device with a piece of rope attached called a garrote. Whitfield had no doubt as to its purpose. It could be used to uh, wrap the, the hands or feet of, of victims. And of course, that's something that uh, is unusual. Not everybody has that in their vehicle. And you would ask the question, well, why do you need this? What are you using it for if you're not using it as a restraint device? Hidden between the rubber matting and the tire wall, investigators found another clue. It was a driver's license belonging to Janet King, one of the young women killed prior to Tamara Jones. Her body had also been found in a cemetery. Since King was a prostitute and Crump was a known John, the item in itself could be explained away. But to Whitfield, the location of the license was incriminating. Either it was intentionally placed there by the suspect to hide it, or perhaps the victim put it there in hopes that in days to come, someone would, would find uh, something uh, of her in that vehicle. Now the team focused on evidence invisible to the human eye. They used a chemical called luminol to test for the presence of blood. A phosphorescent glow revealed a fine spray the pattern was familiar. It matched the blood spatter from Tamara Jones's nose and face. Unfortunately, the droplets were tiny, no larger than pinpoints. There was no way to prove they belonged to the victim. There was nothing that I was able to do because of the microscopic nature of the blood. Uh, that, of course, was prior to the days of DNA, and you needed quite a bit more blood to do complete workups. Investigators vacuumed the interior of the truck, searching for any hair or fibers that could link the victims to the suspect. One intriguing find was a long knife hidden behind the front seat of the truck. In the laboratory, forensic examiners determined that the rope on the garrote was the same diameter as the ligature marks found on the wrists of the victims. Perhaps one of the most important pieces of evidence was a long strand of hair, one that couldn't have come from the suspect. Analysis of the root showed that it had not just fallen out, it had been ripped out of the scalp. The hair strand was compared to samples taken from Tamara Jones. 
the color and texture didn't match. When it was compared with Janet King's hair, however, it matched. Both were colored with identical hair dye. Technicians were confident that they had come from the same person. While the evidence from inside the truck was compelling, all it proved was that Janet King had been inside the vehicle. Now, detectives needed to tie Michael Tyrone Crump's vehicle to the murders. Time was running out. Without solid evidence, Crump would remain free, and more women could wind up dead. Authorities in Tampa, Florida were certain they were dealing with a serial killer. Two recent homicides bore striking similarities to a string of murders that went back more than two years. Detective Robert Parrish needed to connect Tamara Jones' murder to suspect Michael Crump's truck. Tire tracks left at the scene were his best hope. He sent the tire casts made at the crime scene, along with the vehicle's tires, to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. There, analyst Oral Woods studied the treads to see if Crump's truck had made the impressions found near Tamara Jones's body. Woods was surprised that Crump's truck had three different types of tires. The two front tires had similar treads. The rear tires had different tread designs. Two of the tread designs on Crump's tires matched the tread designs in the casts made at the crime scene. And I told Detective Perry, sir, we're definitely in the ballpark. We could, definitely could do something with them that there was class characteristics present in the cast as well as some individual characteristics. Class characteristics like tire size and tread design can indicate a specific manufacturer. By carefully comparing photographs, Woods determined that the tire tracks at the crime scene had identical class characteristics to Crump's rear tires. He then analyzed the casts and the tires for individual characteristics. Things like nicks, tread wear, or embedded pieces of gravel that can make a tire track as unique as a fingerprint. On the right rear tire, he found what he was looking for. I found one area on the tire that has some cuts and nicks, which I was also able to find on the plaster cast that was poured at the crime scene. I went one step further. I made a, a plaster cast of that area and recorded the same individual characteristics. Woods confirmed that the tire track found at the crime scene was made by the suspect's right rear tire. On February 7th, Michael Crump went to the Tampa Police Department to ask about getting his truck back. But first, Detective Parrish had some important questions for him. Like how a woman he'd been seen with on October 9th was found dead the next day. And why his tire tracks were found several feet from her body. Crump again denied knowing Tamara Jones. He claimed that he'd been working in the area and cut through the cemetery the night before the murder. Let me show you something, what was found in your truck. You see that? That's her license. And that was found But in when the truck. detective brought out one more piece of evidence, Janet King's driver's license, Crump was surprised and sensed that he had been caught. He's a big guy, and he had he slumped his shoulders down and looked down, which um, indicated to me that I had, with the license, showing him the license, that I had struck a nerve. Crump admitted to picking up Tamara Jones on the night in question. He claimed they fought and that Tamara had tried to stab him. He admitted to strangling her, but swore it was in self-defense. To the detective, Crump's version of her death could not explain the restraint device and ligature marks left on the victim. 
the evidence pointed to a well-planned M.O. that Crump had used before. Detectives next questioned Crump about the murder of Janet King. He admitted to once having picked her up, but claimed she left him within minutes. He said he knew nothing about the other seven victims. They didn't buy his explanations. All indications are that because of the other black females turned up a similar type of death, that he was involved in those. Uh, we were able to tie him 100% uh, to two of the homicides that were similar, but not enough evidence to tie him to the others. In separate trials, Crump was found guilty of the murders of both Tamara Jones and Janet King. He received two life sentences without the possibility of parole. The other murder cases remain officially unsolved. Michael Tyrone Crump attacked women he randomly selected from the streets. But in North Carolina, an innocent encounter with a stranger ends in violence and death. On August 8, 1990, a Raleigh, North Carolina police officer responded to a report about a suspicious minivan parked on a side street. The officer called in the tag numbers. The vehicle was registered to 24-year-old Katie Valoria, an employee at a nearby hospital. The previous evening, Katie's husband had reported her missing. The officer made a gruesome discovery. Inside the van was the new dead body of a young woman. As police cordoned off the area, crime scene investigators arrived on the scene. Detective John Beasley examined the van. Indications were looking through the windows. There was a struggle inside the van based on the fact that her shoes were located in the front part of the van. Her body is in the back of the van. Pantyhose were around her neck. They had been pulled tight. They weren't knotted or anything, but they were, they were still tight around her neck. It was obvious she had been strangled. The victim's clothing and purse were missing. There was also evidence suggesting sexual assault. Investigators scoured the exterior of the van for clues. A canine team was called in to assist. The handler gave the dog the scent and commanded him to track. The dog led the handler down the street and away from the van. Crime scene investigator W.E. Hensley was part of the search team. Basically, it told us that whoever parked that van there on this early in the morning got out of the van on the driver's side, went up to the street to the employee parking gate of the hospital, went by that gate and went to an area where there was a parking space. And that was significant. It appeared the attack had started here. Police searched the area, but found no additional clues. The van was taken to the Raleigh police impound lot, where the body was removed for autopsy. I felt that in moving the van, we would remove the entire crime scene with the body in it and move it to a location where it could be processed properly. Hensley didn't want to lose any critical hair or fiber evidence by opening the van under less than ideal conditions. Every crime scene tells a story. The time of day, the ambient conditions, who was the victim, what kind of signature might have been left by the suspect, 
As far as processing the vehicle, we felt that trace evidence, which is hairs, fibers, things of that nature, were, were going to be very important to the case. Of course, you never rule out the possibility of fingerprints or any other kind of uh, impressions that you might get. They dusted for prints, but only found a few useless smudges. The killer, it appeared, had tried to wipe his prints before abandoning the vehicle. Whoever went into that vehicle left some of their self there and then took some of that vehicle with them. And so we were looking for any traces of those two criteria. In the front seat, they found a pair of women's shoes. They were scraped on both the heel and toe. A set of jumper cables was also found in the front seat. The jumper cables indicated that possibly the victim uh, was in the process of helping someone with a, with a vehicle problem, probably in the parking lot. On the driver's floor mat, investigators spotted muddy footprints. There was an impression on these mats, and it appeared to be that of a tennis shoe. We felt possibly that may be of value to us. But the mats had to be handled with extreme care. What we had to be concerned with is that the mats are flexible. In flexing the mats or moving them about much, you were gonna, uh, you were gonna actually distort the impression left in mud. So we had to keep them perfectly flat place them in boxes and tape them over so that we could transport these without disturbing the, Im the impressions. Technicians searched for trace evidence. Any hair or fiber adhering to the tape lift would be preserved and examined. They found some hairs embedded in the ceiling of the van. They were inconsistent with the victim's hair, which meant they could belong to her killer. Detectives theorized that the killer had climbed on top of the victim and rubbed his head against the ceiling of the van. Investigator Hensley began to piece together a profile of the killer. From all indications, he was in the employee parking lot and therefore may be associated with the victim to some extent in that they worked at the same place. At autopsy, the medical examiner observed contusions on the victim's neck and determined she had been strangled to death. Strands of hair were removed and placed in an envelope. The hairs went to the crime lab, where analysts could compare them to other strands found during the investigation. There was also evidence of sexual assault. The examiner collected samples of biological fluids found on the victim. A brutal rapist and violent killer was loose on the streets of Raleigh, North Carolina detectives had to find him before he could strike again. In North Carolina, police investigated the violent rape and murder of a 24-year-old wife and mother. With little information and no witnesses, detectives went to the hospital where Katie Valoria worked. According to her colleagues, Katie was well-liked and had no enemies. On the night of her death, she left work just before 6 p.m. The co-worker described Katie as a devoted wife and mother. She got along well with everyone in the workplace. Katie's colleagues said she couldn't imagine Katie having a single enemy in the world. A colleague who left moments later didn't see her or any strange individuals in the parking lot.
Without any witnesses, investigators would have to try a new approach. Since Katie's purse was not in her car, the killer might have stolen her credit cards. Detective Beasley contacted her bank and learned that on the night of the murder, someone used her cash card three times at the same ATM. We got $100 out the first time you used it, and that was all you could write at that time from a cash point. So on one day, is $100. He went back, tried to use it again, and then tried to use it a third time. Detectives retrieved the ATM security camera photos, but they were too blurry to identify the man using the machine. Between the first and second transaction, another customer used the machine. The man told police that he remembered the encounter vividly. A young black man had just made a withdrawal when he arrived but he didn't seem to be finished with his business. He was standing next to him when he got the $100 out. And then he saw the guy try to use the card again. And he said he was acting suspicious because he was wondering why it was taking him so long. He'd already seen him take the money out, so he knew he couldn't do it but one time, and here he is up there trying to use it again. The witness gave a police sketch artist information regarding the suspect's height, weight, coloring, and facial features. Now armed with a detailed description, investigators went to the hospital. Someone recognized the face. It looked like a man who worked in the hospital laundry. The laundry room supervisor confirmed that the picture resembled 23-year-old Michael Sexton. His timesheet showed that he'd been on the job the day of Katie's murder, but disappeared that afternoon. She said he returned around 6.30. He'd been missing for like two hours, and all of a sudden he comes running into the hospital, says he's got to go home, he's been having car trouble, and books, and he doesn't show up for work on Thursday and Friday. To the detectives, Michael Sexton was acting like a man with something to hide. But they were still a long way from linking him to Katie's rape and murder. Detectives went to the home that Sexton shared with his girlfriend, who allowed them to search the residence. They collected some of his uniforms and pairs of tennis shoes, according to W.E. Hensley. We collected three pairs of tennis shoes, and we took those all into our possession. And of course, uh, they were marked as potential evidence items, and we took those back to our lab to analyze for any possible matches. The suspect's shoes and the muddy floor mats were sent to the Wake County Identification Bureau. There, Johnny Leonard specializes in footprint analysis. That's one thing about criminals. Uh, they may put on gloves, they can put stockings over their faces, but hardly anybody thinks about their feet because that's what you run with, that's what you walk on. So I'll, I always believe that footprints are the, is the most overlooked evidence at crime scenes. Leonard studied the muddy footprints, looking first for class characteristics like tread pattern. He then looked for individual characteristics, like cuts or gouges. Next, he studied the three pairs of sneakers taken from the suspect's home. Looking at the footprints, I could easily say that two of the sets of shoes did not make those tracks, because you can obviously look at them and see that the class characteristics were not the same. But the third pair was a similar size and make as the print from the crime scene. Leonard dusted the bottom of the shoe with magnetic powder. Then, with a wide piece of tape, he lifted the sole design and adhered it to a backing card. The card was placed in a large camera 
where it would be photographed and transferred to a transparency. Once it was developed, they could lay the transparency over the photograph of the mat for a comparison. But that would take time. They still needed to locate Sexton, who hadn't been seen in days. Detectives in North Carolina worked around the clock investigating the brutal murder of 24-year-old wife and mother, Katie Veloria. A man named Michael Sexton had been identified as a suspect, but had yet to be located. At the crime lab, latent print examiner Johnny Leonard had lifted latent shoe prints from the evidence taken from the crime scene. He placed a transparency of the suspect's sneaker print over a transfer of the floor mat from the victim's car. Leonard compared individual characteristics and finally found what he was looking for. That was a little cut at the arch of one of the uh, treadwear designs that was present also on the uh, known shoes. So without a doubt, we knew that it was the same, made from the same shoe. Investigators had evidence that tied the perpetrator to the vehicle, but still had nothing putting him in contact with the victim. While latent shoe prints are usually obtained from flat objects at a crime scene, even irregular surfaces can yield the occasional clue. Leonard applied magnetic powder to the upper sole and heel of the victim's shoe. And lo and behold, a very small portion of a shoe track appeared. He set the partial shoe print on a backing card and compared it to the full-size print of the suspect's sneaker. The partial print from Katie Valoria's shoe matched a portion of the suspect's shoe print. Without a doubt, the suspect had been in contact with the victim personally. Police went to the home that Sexton shared with his girlfriend, according to Detective Beasley. The detectives located Michael Sexton at that point. We told him that we were talking to people at the hospital, and it was his turn would he come down and, and talk with us about it, which he agreed to do. At the police department, Sexton was cooperative. He agreed to give biological samples for testing. Sexton swabbed the inside of his mouth to give a DNA sample. And he willingly allowed for hairs to be taken. These two would be compared in the lab. Criminalist Hensley recognized the importance of the evidence. What we were dealing with and what we felt we were dealing with as far as evidence potential in this particular vehicle was blood, body fluids, hairs, fibers, clothing, and uh, those are the things that we concentrated on. Using a comparison microscope, examiners looked for similarities between two hair samples. Color, length, and diameter are among the major features analyzed. The known sample taken from the victim at autopsy and the unknown sample from the victim's van were compared side by side. The analysis confirmed the victim was not the source of the hair found in the van. But when the hair from the victim's van was compared to the sample taken from the suspect, it was practically a perfect match. That wasn't the only evidence placing Michael Sexton in the back of Katie Valoria's van. To fully process the clothing taken from Sexton's house, technicians laid the clothing out across a wide table. Using clear adhesive tape, they combed every inch of fabric for hair and fibers. 
Fibers from the victim's van were found on the suspect's clothing, and fibers from the clothing were found in the van. Investigators still needed to determine if the suspect's DNA matched the biological fluids found on the victim. Certainly the body fluids that we found on the victim's body had the potential for DNA analysis. And they, they are uh, more or less a positive form of identification other than fingerprints. If you can't find fingerprints, that certainly is one of the better forms of identification. To analyze the suspect's DNA samples, scientists used a process called electrophoresis to separate specific enzymes out of each sample. Certain enzymes vary from person to person. Electrophoresis utilizes an electric current to separate the enzymes for analysis. The sample is placed in a gel and a current is applied causing the enzymes to move through the gel. Each enzyme moves a certain distinct distance, creating a pattern of bands. If two blood samples create the same pattern, it's probable they came from the same source. In this case, they matched. At the police station, detectives confronted Sexton with the evidence. He denied everything. As the interview went on, he kept digging a little bit deeper hole for himself and denying that he even knew her. And I think then he started looking for kind of an out, something that would make him look in the best light. Sexton told police that he was having car trouble. He said that the victim offered to drive him to his cousin's to get some jumper cables. And he said he, when he got around there that she uh, consented to have sex with him. And, and then when they got in the back of the van, she changed her mind. And he knew she had seen his name tag and all that and was going to report him. Detectives knew there was more to the story. They believed that Sexton used his car trouble as bait. Fueled by a criminal appetite, he took advantage of Katie's kindness and overpowered her. The people of the state of North Carolina convicted Michael Sexton of first degree murder and rape. He received the death sentence and was executed in November 2001. When a killer and a victim share no personal history, detectives can find themselves working in the dark. But for investigators committed to finding justice, no piece of evidence is too small. Today, forensic science can uncover a murder and bring to light evidence of a lethal encounter.